You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is about where you choose to live and what impact it has on your personal freedom. So we've talked about lots of aspects of different ways to achieve more freedom and things that you can do um, in your life to, to live as freely as possible. And in this episode, I want to talk about different theories or views that are out there about how your choice of where to live impacts on how free you are, both in terms of your freedom at work and in your personal relationships and, and so forth. Does it matter where you live? Does it have an impact on your freedom? I think I think it really can do. And lots of other people who've written about how to get more freedom um, in your life have actually talked about this subject. So what I'd like to do is to share a few of the ideas about how where you live can influence your level of freedom that I've read in different authors and and people who've written about liberty and to, to share some thoughts of my own about it as well. Now, this won't cover every aspect of, of where you live and all of the choices involved in, in where you choose to live. But I do want to talk particularly about the choice of living in a city or in the countryside or a small town where you geographically choose to live. So that's what we're going to talk about here. And, and I think there's an opportunity to talk about other aspects of uh, where you live, maybe in future episodes. So... What are the views out there about how where you choose to live can impact on your level of freedom? The first one that I want to share is what I would like to call the Walden idea. And that is an idea that was probably best expressed in Henry David Thoreau's book, um, Walden, which is a, a really classic text by an individualist anarchist from the 19th century. We did actually do a... Um, uh, discussion about it in a previous uh, episode of the voluntary life so uh, i'll put a link to that in the show notes but essentially uh, the ideas that henry david thoreau uh, talks about that relate to where you choose to live and how that impacts on your freedom are that the city uh, is where the state is and it's also where the sort of conformist where the conformists live who will try to limit your freedom and for Thoreau, the way to achieve freedom is to go and live outside the city, alone in the wilderness, in the woods in his case, um, in a rural setting and be self-sufficient. So get yourself out of the clutches of the state and also of the conformists around you who will try to limit your freedom and make you act in certain ways and go and live in the wilderness where you can act and be in the way that you want to be and, and achieve more freedom in that way. And I think this idea is still popular um, in many ways. Uh, a lot of the books that are about survivalism, um, sort of libertarian oriented um, books, which are about how to go and set up your own self-sufficient homestead um, so that if the economy collapses or there's war or something like that, then you can be free and you can be outside of all of that away from the oppression of the state. A lot of those ideas are very much along the lines that Henry David Thoreau was talking about when he was promoting self-sufficiency and living away from the city in his book Walden. So that's the first idea, is the, the Walden idea of living alone in a rural setting, being self-sufficient. The next idea that I want to talk about is what I'd like to call the Galt's Gulch idea. And this is an idea that I think Ayn Rand's book, Atlas Shrugged, uh, really um, epitomizes very well. And that's where the, the phrase Galt's Gulch comes from. Um, if you haven't read it, we also did uh, a discussion about Atlas Shrugged in a, a previous podcast. I'll put a, a link to it in the show notes. But just very briefly, the characters in Atlas Shrugged are all... Uh, individualists who want to to be free but who, who are experiencing an ever increasingly oppressive state and they choose to go and live in a community away from the cities in a gulch that is like a hidden valley 
where only people who share the same values go and live together and kind of create a free community away from everything else. And so it's the rationale is similar to uh, the rationale in Walden. The idea is that the city is where the state is and where the statists are. And so getting away from them by going and forming a community in the wilderness is a way to achieve more freedom. And there's very much a focus in this idea on the fact that the, the cities are going to self-destruct, that statism is kind of rampant. And consequently, it's not just a question of going to live out in the woods because, um, because you are able to be more free there, but there's also a focus on, on sort of the forward-looking uh, focus that the state is going to collapse, so you need to get out and go and form your own community away from the existing uh, community of, of the city that you live in because of statism run amok, basically. And so the idea is really to go and live with a small community of like-minded people in a rural setting Again, similar to the Walden idea, the Goldscotch idea is very much about self-sufficiency. And there is still, this is a popular idea today too, there are still people who, who look towards setting up this kind of uh, community. Um, Doug Casey is one example of somebody who has set up a community in Argentina for like-minded people who are interested in liberty and freedom and want to go and uh, live in an area that is away from the uh, Western countries that are going to experience economic collapse, in his view, um, in the very near future. And so that, I think, is a very similar kind of idea um, to Gold's Gulch. Now, the third idea that I want to talk about is one that I am really interested in and really excited about. And I think it's one that uh, is often not thought about um, in the liberty-minded community. Um, and I, I, I call this idea the idea that city air makes you free. That's actually a saying from the Middle Ages, from Germany, where um, the idea was that by going to the city, serfs could achieve their freedom. They could live free from serfdom and actually live as free people in cities. And the idea really is that it's cities, it's urban centers that are the engines of liberty, individualism, and all of the benefits that we have of capitalism, the growth of the market and so forth. So really, um, just living in a city increases both your social freedoms and your material freedoms. And this idea has been talked about by some authors like Jane Jacobs in particular who wrote a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. But it's a much less popular viewpoint um, when it comes to thinking about where should you choose to live in order to achieve maximum freedom in your own lifetime to get the maximum freedom that you can uh, within an unfree world. So this, this is really the, the key kind of difference that I want to talk about between the city air makes you free idea and the ideas of Walden and Galt's Gulch. Um, it's the, the difference between choosing to live in a city or choosing to live in the countryside, in a rural setting, even in the wilderness, either um, alone or with a small community. And really it's the choice of going for the benefits of interdependence that living in a city gives you versus going for the benefits of self-sufficiency that living in a rural setting or in a sort of isolated community will give you. I think the benefits of interdependence are really unappreciated in writings about where you can live to get more freedom in your life. And I think the benefits of self-sufficiency have been really overemphasized in previous writings. So that's why I want to talk more in more detail about this idea of how the city um, can give you more freedom. Because I think in most cases, it really is interdependence itself that actually gives you the opportunity to live more free. So let's talk about specific kinds of freedom and how they differ in terms of where you choose to live. In terms of freedom in your working life, in your working relationships, 
the really important thing about the city is the benefit of the division of labor and the choice that you get about who to work with. If you live in a big city, then you have this diverse economy, lots of people engaged in lots and lots of very um, diverse specializations and just also just a large number of people. And that gives you the opportunity to work with people who you want to work with. You have more choice about finding a place where you'd like to work or individuals who you'd like to trade with. And you can really take advantage of the division of labor that enables you to specialize in something that you want to do and to get all the benefits of trade that really have given rise to you know, the, all of the material progress we've had. It's that idea, again, of comparative advantage where everyone gets to specialize in something of higher value that they're able to do. And by, by benefiting from all the other specializations around them, there's more uh, wealth generated and everyone gets to benefit from the material progress that that brings. And that is a really urban phenomenon. It's only with big cities that you can get a really good division of labor and a diversity in the economy. And self-sufficiency is much more limiting. If you go and live in a small community away from everything, there's a very limited amount of things that you're going to be able to do because the local economy just won't support it. And this is really something that Ayn Rand didn't fully appreciate when she wrote about Galt's Gulch, because the problem with Galt's Gulch is that it wouldn't have worked. It actually wouldn't be possible for the engineers and scientists and other really highly specialized people to go and live in an isolated valley somewhere, a small number of people, and to continue in their very, very sort of specific and specialized trades. Because it's only within a really diverse economy that you can have research scientists or, you know, symphony composers and the kind of people who were in, in Gold's Gulch you know, they wouldn't be able to practice those trades in Gold Scotch because there just wouldn't be a large enough market to support that kind of economic diversity. And Ayn Rand didn't really think that through, uh, in my opinion. Um, so that's an interesting you know, aspect of this idea of Gold Scotch. Actually, you know, it, it limits what you can do uh, in terms of your own opportunity to benefit from the amazing synergy that comes with urban living, with capitalism, with the marketplace and with the division of labor. You just can't do that in isolation. So although I think, you know, Galt's Gulch would be an awesome place to live, it would be fa fantastic for a short time. To me, it looks more like a place to go um, and hang out with friends as a kind of extended stay or a vacation or something, or maybe to, to have a change from your trade or your um, your uh, entrepreneurship to have maybe a year a career break or something like that but it's not the kind of place that would be able to support these very very specialized jobs that all of the free people that Ayn Rand imagines in her novel would want to do and at the same level you know you can you can see the problems in the idea of the of Walden as well self-sufficiency is actually a really difficult thing to achieve we now live in a time where we enjoy such amazing material benefits from the division of labor that if you actually try and be self-sufficient for an extended period of time, life becomes incredibly hard and incredibly difficult. Um, Henry David Thoreau wasn't even really self-sufficient. He was receiving supplies from the outside world, and he was also living on a large estate owned by his friend Walt Whitman. So he was, it was more like he was camping in a large country estate, he wasn't really going off into the wilderness and being fully self-sufficient. He was very much connected to nearby urban economic progress and development in the shape of his friend Walt Whitman, who owned a large estate and had all the benefits of being connected to the local economy. And when he needed to, um, after a year or two, he just went back into society and benefited from all of those economic interdependencies. So I think that's another aspect of these ideas of self-sufficiency, that they, they may be uh, a really interesting and fun thing to do for a short while, but in terms of m more long-term opportunities for freedom, they actually limit your choices in terms of what you can work and do. Uh, and that itself, I think, is an important limit on freedom. 
Another aspect of living in cities that I think gives you more freedom is in personal relationships. So when you live in a large urban settlement, you just have a far greater choice of who to socialize with. Cities give you the opportunity to find people who share your interests and share your values because the more people who live in one sort of dense area, the more diversity there is and the more opportunity there is for you to pick and choose who it is that you want to socialize with. And that's an opportunity. If you live in a small community, you know, you're really not going to necessarily have a lot of choice about people to socialize with because there just won't be that many people there. Obviously, the idea in Galt's culture is that you sort of pre-select only people who share your values and your interests, which is, is great. That sort of makes a lot of sense. But it still is limiting in terms of the number of people who you can really uh, choose to hang out with. It's just you don't have a lot of choice in a small community. Another aspect of um, how cities give you more freedom in personal relationships is just the culture of cities is a culture of anonymity. And this is something that a lot of people think is heartless or cruel or something like that. Actually, it's an amazingly progressive and wonderful aspect of urban living. It's a live and let live at, um, attitude that cities kind of foster, which is that everyone who lives in cities realizes that the only way that everyone can get along together is by having this live and let live attitude of it being none of your business what other people around you do you know what your neighbors do and you know what their personal choices are are simply none of your business and that's a sort of general cultural value that urban living fosters and it means that you can also have a huge amount more personal freedom in how you choose to live and this is why of course when it comes to things like your sexual freedom your freedom of sexual orientation it's big cities that have the gay communities that are much more free and able to live uh, in the way that they want to without fear of reprisal. Whereas in small communities and villages, you get a lot more homophobic um, attitudes or, or just generally uh, prejudiced attitudes towards people's personal choices in terms of their sexual orientation. In big cities, you have a lot more immigrants and consequently you have a lot more diversity of people from different backgrounds. So you have this live and let, let live attitude, which is very much um, uh, a, a mixing of people from lots and lots of places uh, and lots and lots of origins. Whereas in small communities, you have xenophobia and you have a lot more prejudice and you have a lot less of a sense of international tolerant diversity that you get in big cities and of course in cities you have a lot freer relationships in terms of the kind of roles that women are able to take on within society the kind of jobs that they can get and so forth there's always more choice and more opportunity um, within big cities than there is in small towns and villages and in comparison if you've ever been to villages or lived in one for a while you know that in comparison to the, the kind of live and let live attitude in big cities, in villages you tend to get a very nosy and interfering kind of culture where everybody is so uh, closely linked to each other that they kind of want to know what everyone else's business is and they kind of have an opinion about whether or not it fits in the life of the village because there's a much more of a sense of restrictive community in comparison to city living. Now, there are lots and lots of other things to say about the choice of where you choose to live and just whether or not you choose to live in a big city or in a village or out in the rural wilderness is only one of them. But I wanted to share this sort of view of different ideas about how your choice of where to live can impact on your freedom because I think it's something that is really, really worth thinking about. Where you live is something that you can influence and change and have real traction and change in your own life. And that can have an impact on how free you get to feel and how free you get to actually live. And I think it's really interesting to think about this distinction between the city and the countryside. As I said, because a lot of um, writing about how to live more freely focuses on getting away from the big city and going to live somewhere on your own or with a small community in order to be free. 
But I think it's really worth thinking about whether the, the opposite is true, that you, you're more free when you go and live in the big city. The idea of going to the city to, to live more free is so deeply rooted in, in our culture. You hear it in so many rock songs, pop songs. It's something that many people talk about. But then again, when people write about how you can, can be more free, they tend to focus on actually getting out of the city. So something to think about. And, and one last thought to share with you while, while you do think about that choice. This is the first time in history during our lifetimes when the majority of people do actually live in big cities. I think 260 million Americans live in 3% of the country that is the urbanized areas. And that trend towards moving into big cities is something that for the first time is now the majority of humanity. And that trend has been something that has been very, very clearly linked to the rise of capitalism and the rise of individualism and liberty. So these ideas of liberty and the material freedoms provided by the growth of capitalism are very, very urban. It's very closely linked to cities. Cities have changed our culture and changed the way that we think about freedom and liberty and changed the level of freedom that we actually experience. And that is something that for the first time, the majority of us are now coming to experience. So what will the future hold for us when you know, we continue to urbanize? Because that trend is not going away. It's actually intensifying. Despite the internet and despite all the technologies that people assumed would make uh, people less urban, we're actually getting more urban as a whole. And I hope that means that the opportunity for us to be more free as a whole is there too. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.